Welcome to Great Depression, Part 1 of 2, 1929 to 1932. This is Melinda Klein. Unemployment and poverty remained high throughout the Great Depression, greatly affecting the working class most of all. Federal programs offered some relief, but somehow the invisible hand of the economy ruled the day. With the Great Depression came new regulations to businesses, such as the banking industry. For workers, organized labor found its voice in the early 1930s. The Great Depression lingers in the collective memory of grandparents. It was a tough time for millions of Americans. The Great Depression was a worldwide economic turndown which started in 1929 and lasted through most of the 1930s until war in Europe would rise again by 1939. Few people anticipated the stock market crash of 1929. After the collapse, however, the economy experienced a spiral turndown. By 1932, the median income was half of what it had been in 1929. By 1932, one out of four working class Americans, 12.8 million people, were out of work and industrial production had almost ground to a halt. The Great Depression had complex origins. While wages fell and businesses and banks closed, some businesses increased profits while holding wages down. This pattern reduced customer spending. Initial business and government reactions to the stock market crash were optimistic. Hoover, the ever great planner, did not sit idly by and watch the country sink towards disaster. He called conferences of businessmen and labor leaders to find solutions. He met with mayors and governors, encouraging them to speed up public works projects, which would have created jobs. In addition, President Hoover supported a tax cut, which Congress enacted in 1929. However, these things and more did little to stimulate spending or put life back into the economy. A large percentage of the American middle class was able to survive this ordeal. Those in professions where skills and jobs were considered depression proof are listed here. People holding government jobs such as civil service, teachers both public and at the college level, after all education continues in good time and bad, doctors and health professionals, the hospitals and clinics, yes, stayed open, helping the sick and dying. Politicians, our government continued to operate. And of course, for our courts and judicial system, which continued to operate, we always need lawyers. Middle class professional jobs offered continuous work, while cutbacks were meager, and sometimes, as in health fields and government, this created great demand for employment during tough times for qualified workers. For the middle class, daily life was made more secure if these workers had little debt before the stock market crash, had liquid savings, and generally lived without overt extravagances. Middle class households managed to get through the economic depression by adapting to conditions spending wisely and avoiding unnecessary purchases or other things such as limiting vacations. However, the middle class were known to enjoy their long ocean voyages to Europe well into the late part of the 1930s, even with growing conflicts with Nazi Germany. One commercial industry that flourished in America during the 1930s was the movie industry, located mainly in Hollywood, California. The emergence of sound films in the late 1920s, combined with the escapism 
that film provided to a nation down on its luck made the film industry one of the few that succeeded in profits and in setting a national mood. Very popular was Shirley Temple Films. These were leading attractions. Even in the face of hopelessness and trying circumstances, the situation spoke to American audiences. Nothing seemed to stop the downward economic cycle. The stock market, after appearing to bottom out in the winter of 1930-31, continued to decline. The rich reacted by hoarding gold and feared that the poor and working class would rise up in America in revolt. But not everyone lost money in the crash. Some saw it coming, such as FDR. However, 12 million Americans experienced foreclosures and evictions by 1932, as 23% of the workforce was unemployed. As people were evicted from their homes and migrated looking for work, Americans did not rebel against the government. Instead, the common question was that they wanted jobs. But with reduced customer spending, how could the economy recover? President Hoover did not believe that the government should directly aid the people. Once again, business agreed that it was a good idea, but they were incapable of coordinating such organization on their own. Hoover's voluntary cooperation failed, and his policies during his tenure proved that the government needed to take an active role in the economy if it was going to recover from this depression. The legacy of the Great War and global economic policies of the 1920s had been one cause of the economic turndown in the United States. As the U.S. sunk into the Depression, the world followed. For example, by 1931 in June, the German financial system, which had gone from hyperinflation to false stability, was in chaos. By September, England abandoned the gold standard, which led to a decline in international trade and lending. Americans began to blame President Hoover for some of the disaster. Hoover believed firmly in loans, but not handouts. Also, he thought it was the responsibility of the state, local governments, and private charities to provide direct relief to the unemployed and the needy. By 1933, over 4,000 banks had closed their doors. Individual banks could not stay open with the sudden demands by depositors to withdraw their money. Banks had invested heavily in the stock market, placing their depositors at risk. Stronger banks called in loans to smaller banks, forcing thousands to close. The Bonus March was a collective group of about 20,000 World War I veterans and their families who demonstrated in Washington, D.C. during the spring and summer of 1932, seeking immediate aim of a bonus granted by the Adjusted Service Certificate Law of 1924 for a payment in 1945. While Republicans nominated President Hoover to run for re-election in 1932, his lack of popularity opened the door for Democrats. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, Governor of New York, won the Democratic nomination. In 1932, with his New Deal, FDR did win the election. 